Okay, Mike is on. Tell me when you're ready to start, David. <laughs> we are. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna work our way into the '90s today, <laughs> uh, and then uh, on Friday I'll I'll talk about like what we what we currently use for um, uh, for spin echo. So spin echo, remember that's where you correct the inhomogeneities that come from static field offsets and you get a T2. Uh, you can get like a, an accurate to get rid of the star part of T2. But you can use it for other stuff too, but that's one of the, the main, main uses for it. Uh, in particular because a lot of times you do a T2 image to see like if there's a tumor or something or some swelling or something growing. So uh, before I do that, I'm going to talk about uh, you know, this the the frequency encoding direction doesn't wrap. So, so why is that? Is that possible? So, if you actually, you know, if you if you run a scanner, if the, the scanner technician will know that there's no wrap around in the the frequency encode direction, uh, but there is in the in the phase encode direction or the second second phase encode direction, and so. So why is why doesn't frequency encoding wrap? Because Marty said that frequency encoding is the same as phase encoding, so shouldn't it wrap? Uh, yes, it actually should. So you know, so why, why you know why doesn't it why doesn't it wrap? So you know, so any scanner person knows you know wrap doesn't occur in frequency and code direction. So why, so why is that? So it's only, you know, only in, you know, phase and code uh, directions, you know, possibly more than one. So, so why is that? Does that, you know, does that actually sort of make any sense? Uh, because as we see from the uh, Fourier transform, it's yeah, it's, it's the Fourier transform in the the phase encode direction isn't any different than the Fourier transform in the, in the frequency encode direction. So so why is that? So it's because there's two things that you can do in the frequency encode direction that you can't do in the phase encode direction. And so so one thing you can do is you can just uh, sample in the frequency encode direction, just sampled two times faster in, you know, freak. Uh, it's no cost. No cost to do that because uh, you're, you're doing a readout. So, you know, so, so here's, let's just draw just the phase encode and the frequency. So here's the phase encode part which we do, you know, after the RF pulse, but before we start recording data. And then here's the, the frequency encode part where we, so this is, um, you know, this is phase and freak. So, so we can, <clears throat> basically we can just, without losing any time, uh, you know, we could sample at that rate, or we could just sample it at twice the rate, phase over sampling. <laughs> and so that doesn't that doesn't kill any time doing that. And so what that will we know what that will do. That will just sort of uh, expand the field of view. Now that doesn't stop the wraparound, but it sort of like moves it, it moves it further out. Uh, but there's another tricky way that you can stop uh, stop the wraparound, and Remember I said you shouldn't think of MRI as, um, you shouldn't think of um, the way MRI works as put a gradient on, change the precession frequency, and then use the Fourier transform to undo the precession frequency, you know, essentially map frequency to space. That's one way of sort of thinking about it, but it's a kind of a garden path that gets you confused and uh, doesn't it sort of covers up the fact that phase and frequency encoding are the same thing. But if we if we go back to that viewpoint, uh, when we put a gradient on, say we put a gradient on, you know, from front to back, 
So here's our gradient. So this is, you know, a gradient. Then basically that's going to be, you know, proportional to uh, the frequency, precession frequency. And so, so one thing we can do, so, so that means that, you know, at this point, the precession frequency is going to be higher, going to be lower over here. So one thing we can do is we can just take the signal that we get out, which has all these different frequencies in it, which I said, don't think of it that way, but it does. Uh, that's what's causing the phase wraps to occur. The fact that, you know, these guys are ahead and, and, and you know, spins at this end of the gradient are ahead and spins at this end of the gradient are behind. That, that's what's actually causing those little stripes of spin phase to occur. Um, but there are different frequencies. And so what we can do is we can just filter them out. So, so we can just basically do like a bandpass filter. That's what would be called a bandpass filter. So basically, so this is, you know, bandpass, meaning like let, only let frequencies that are from here to here through. So if we, if we do a bandpass filter, then we can get rid of the replicas. <laughs> uh, because uh, that's, that's a, if you work it through, you can see that's a way to sort of like stamp out the wraparound. So, so wraparound does occur, does occur in the frequency in code direction. It's not uh, magically different than the, the phase in code direction. It's just that we've got several ways of fiddling with it. And you can't, you, you can't, so, so this is, uh, uh, so the second way, so that was, you know, the first way was just sort of expand the field, expand the wraparound. Um, but you, you could, you know, analog or digital analog filter out uh, signal at edge. So it turns out you can't do that. So what about, you know, so why can't we do this thing to the phasing code direction in order, in order to fix the phasing code direction? So uh, the, the problem is, uh, if you did this, you know, uh, you know, can't do with phase uh, because, you know, two times, two times um, acquisition time. So why is that? Because the uh, you just turn the phasing code gradient onto a particular setting and then record some data. If you were going to record more phasing code steps, it's just going to take more time. So if we doubled our sampling of the fineness of the different, uh, the different phase encoding steps, we'd have to double the time of the scan. So that's, that's not going to work. Uh, and this one, uh, we can't do this one with phase because... because the gradient isn't on uh, because you know phase encode gradient isn't on and not on during recording so when when we're doing this recording over here uh, the frequency encode gradient is on but the phase encode we just did before and so we can't so we can't we can't do this this hack, and so you just have to put up with the fa with the with the wraparound, and you know that's for most things it isn't a problem. Like with the, if you're talking about going this direction across the head, well, there's black on either side of the head, so it's not a problem. It is a problem like with the, uh, with the, the head and the neck, so you know the neck can sort of wrap around back in, uh, into the the top of the head if you've got like. If the image, if your field of view is not as big as the thing that you're taking a picture of, like, you know, if you're taking a picture in this direction in the sagittal plane, you've got a body on one side. So, okay, so, so the uh, bottom line is there, um, the bottom line there is, sorry, is that uh, wrap does occur in the frequency code direction uh, because what causes wrap, uh, what causes wrap is just the fact that we're doing discrete samples. That's what that's the, the fundamental thing that that causes wrap is that we're just we're not sampling sort of like all the 
spatial frequencies in between each sample. And, and that generate, even though we're sampling high spatial frequencies, that will, that will generate RAP. So RAP does occur uh, in the frequency encode direction, but in practice we can get rid of it. And so then you would want to make the free frequency encode direction uh, the one, uh, it, if, you're, if you had a problem with your field of view not being big enough for wh what you were taking an image of. Okay. So, and now let's actually move into the 90s. <laughs> so, so what we're going to talk about are, are, and these pulse sequences, which sort of got popular in the 90s, they're, they're actually still used. It's not like they're not used. They're still used today. Uh, and they're generally called, you know, fast spin echo. So there's a bunch of these stupid acronyms that are just words that you just have to, just have to learn if you want to sort of, you know, read these papers. And so, so we'll start off with spin echo, which we can call, I'm old enough so that I actually sat in the scanner for some real slow spin echo. <laughs> uh, so slow spin echo, you know, is generally just called SE or spin echo. And I'll, I'll write out the sequence for slow spin echo so you can sort of see. Um, so slow spin echo is like the morally upstanding spin echo. It's sort of good spin echo. It's, it doesn't have any sort of weird, weird artifacts associated with it. But uh, it takes a really long time. So to scan your whole brain might take like 45 minutes just for one scan. So you'd sit in there 45 minutes later, you know, and obviously if you're taking 45 minutes, well, there could be a lot of movement that's occurring in that, uh, uh, in that time. And so, so we, we need faster spin echo. <laughs> so so uh, the second one I'll talk about is uh, uh, fast spin echo. And unfortunately, that has, uh, that has a number of different acronyms. So it's, it's called, you know, FSE. That's, to me, the most rational one, fast spin echo. But a lot of times it's called turbo spin echo. <laughs> uh, turbo spin echo. And then sometimes it's called rare. I can't remember what that stands for. Uh, those, are all, th those are all the same thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that one. Second, that's that that this one is still commonly, uh, commonly used. So, and then on Friday I'll talk about uh, a, a newer sequence which I call really fast spin echo. <laughs> fast spin echo, and this one uh, on our scanner, this one's called called space, and so that's that's what's more commonly used by research, uh, you know, research fMRI. So. So, so we'll, we'll go over these two today, and then, th and then this one on Friday. Uh, and th the reason to do it, is you you might wonder, like, why didn't why, you know why do we have to hear about the '90s? Uh, well, yeah, it's it's hard to understand the later ones until you see like what the, you know, what what went before, and so that's the, that's the reason to sort of go over these older ones. So and. Sometimes for research purposes, you actually might want to do this one uh, because that one is kind of like the cleanest signal, even though it takes a really long time. Uh, a lot of times you might say, well, I'll, it, it takes too long, so I'll just do a couple slices, you know, if you're, if you're looking for some, some particular contrast. And so you might even use this one. Um, it's not completely out of the, out of the question. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll sort of look at, you know, why is it slow? <laughs> so... So the, so the plan is to, over here, we'll look at where we are in K-space. So this, this, is, this is our, our K-space. So that's, that's the, the K-Y direction, stripes, horizontal stripe direction. And this is the K-X direction, which is the, the vertical stripe uh, direction. And sort of the intermediate directions are like tilted, tilted stripe directions. So, so this is the way people typically think of it. But remember what, you know, a particular point in this space corresponds to some distribution of spin phase stripes across the actual brain. 
So, and then over here, we'll put up the, the actual pulse sequence and see how that relates to where we are in K space. And so, so the first, uh, so the first part here is the, it's the RFN. So what we've actually, uh, what we're stimulating the brain with. And then we'll, in these uh, diagrams, we'll generally put, you know, the, the Z uh, and the Y and the X uh, gradient, gradients here. And then here's the RF, you know, out, what comes out of the brain. Okay, so, so the first thing is we uh, just do a 90 degree pulse. So there's our 90 degree pulse. Um, and what we're going to diagram here is what would we need to do if we wanted to get a T2 weighted scan. So that's that's the the goal of this this one. And so and this this is a 2D sequence. So we'll here I'll add one more here. So so this this is a 3D fast spin echo. That's how that's one way we can sort of get get really fast. These guys uh can be done in 3D but uh I'm just going to diagram a 2D sequence. So this is uh, this is you know 2D you know slice based. So we're selecting a a slice, not not exciting the whole volume. So this is a 2D sequence. So uh, so we first do our RF pulse, and since it's a 2D sequence, uh, we have to turn on the uh, the gradient to set the precession frequency of, of just a slice, and then we play out a frequency-selective RF pulse that will just excite that slice. So that's, that's the first part. So, so what's going on there? Well, what I said is you can, you can, you can sort of think of uh, the RF pulse as, as starting at the middle of that, of that stimulus. And so here's the, the FID coming out which we're not recording, um, which is the transverse magnetization dying away T2 star. Um, and um, so we can sort of think of it as, you know, coming out of the, coming out of the middle there. Uh, and then how does, how does that sort of correspond to what's going on in, in K space? Well, what's going on in K space is, let's just take the idealization that we started a bunch of transverse magnetization that wasn't dephased at all at the, at the center of that pulse. That would put us, that would put us at the center, the center of K-space uh, because there's no, um, uh, that's the zero of K-space. There's no stripes in the, in the X or the Y direction and also not in the Z direction. Uh, but then immediately what happens is we've got a gradient on. And so, so what's that going to do? That's going to cause, that's going to cause basically the stripes to appear in the third dimension of k-space. So it's going to cause uh, stripes to occur that are like you know, like like striping like in in this direction in k-space. Actually, sort of like you know, coming out of k-space, um, which isn't even visible on this diagram because I just drew the X and Y part, but there's a Z part also. Uh, but then we quickly fix them. And so <clears throat> by the time, so you could sort of consider at time A, right in the middle of the pulse, we were at the center of K space. And then we, uh, then we came out of, you know, out of the board uh, in the Z direction, and then, and then we fixed it. And so now, so now we're fixed it. So here's we're back at A now. So now we're actually back in the middle of the middle of K space. So then, what we do is we wait a little while and do uh, a 180 because we want a spin echo. <coughs> so there's the 180 pulse, and what that does is you know whatever magnetization you had here, 
It's kind of like in the transverse plane, you imagine you sort of flip the whole thing over 180 degrees, and then whoever was ahead is behind and vice versa, and then uh, the same amount of time after that, so here's that tau time, uh, the same amount of time after that, we get an echo. So, so basically at, at this time down here, there should be an echo. I drew it, it's a little more, the echo is a little bit more uh, scrunched up in time than I drew it here, but uh, I drew it that way so we can sort of see things a little easier. Okay, so that's our echo, that's what we want to want to record and that's the one that's you know falling off as so the, the peak of that guy is you know e to the minus t over t2 so that got rid of the star part of t2 so there's a couple other things going on before we go back to k space so um uh when we do the rf pulse here we've got to do uh, a slice select for this too, because we we, we only want to fl f if we're just doing a slice and we want to do some other slices at some other time, uh, we need to actually have the slice select gradient on, and this 180 pulse has to be a frequency speci a specific RF pulse, so it will, it will just excite spins in that little slab. Uh, but now, if you ever look at any pulse sequences, you'll see. There's always there's always some ears on the pulse sequence like that. So what are the little what are the little ears on there? And these these little ears are the are the crushers. <laughs> so you always have those on there. And so why? So what is that? So the idea so the idea of a crusher pulse is say our 180 wasn't exactly accurate because you know different parts of the head have slightly different b zeros a uh, b ones not 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 b zeros b one so when you when you turn on the rf it penetrates into the head but it's not completely uniform and so some of the parts of the head are going to have a, a a bigger or less flip angle than 180. and if it's bigger or less than 180 what's going to happen instead of just uh, instead of just flipping it so what we were hoping is, you know, we started off, you know, with that magnetization and then we uh, flipped it. We, we were aiming for that. But what if instead of that, we got, you know, something that was, you know, like that. So if it was something like that, it'll have almost the same, you know, Z magnetization, uh, but it's going to have some uh, transverse magnetization, XY magnetization. And that's going to create a, that's going to create another signal over here. So there'll be, you know, that would uh, potentially, you know, create down here another signal. And then that could sort of, uh, you know, interact with this echo, you get a secondary echo, you know, it, it, you can see it's starting to get a little bit of a mess. And so, so then we use a crusher. And so a crusher is, if the 180 was correct, there shouldn't have been any transverse magnetization because remember, the, the, RF out, the only RF out that we can measure is magnetization transverse. So that's, that's the, only, the only signal we can measure. So the crusher, the idea of the crusher is it's just to wrap up some spin phase stripes of any spurious magnetization transverse that, that appears. So it's just to clean up clean up the mess, because this might not have been exactly 180. Uh, but then why do you, what do you need this ear, this, this pre-crusher ear? And so, so the problem is, say there was some transverse magnetization before we started. Like, for instance, say we scrunched this in, and so, you know, the, the, echo, was, the echo was starting to form, but it hadn't gone down to zero. And so there was some transverse magnetization that was already there. So in that case, uh, we're going to mess it up, but we don't want to mess it up. We just want to mess up the transverse magnetization that came from the incorrect 180. And so if we do another lobe before there, you, know, you might wonder, why is it up? Well, it's up because there's a 180 in between it. And so, so this thing is, so this thing is, let's, 
if, if this thing is going to mess up some transverse magnetization that we want, uh, then what this one is going to do is on, pre-unmess it up. And then when we do this one, uh, the effect of this one on the magnetization that we wanted to keep that, was, that came from before uh, will be canceled, and so we'll keep it. So, it's a, so you can sort of, when, and because the 180 is in between, what we're actually doing is we're doing, uh, we're essentially doing something like that, sort of pre-messing up the pre-existing transverse magnetization, and then afterwards uh, crushing the, the, the part we don't want but that came from the 180, but leaving, sort of fixing up, you know, fixing up the part that we wanted to keep, the transverse magnetization that we wanted to keep before the 180. So you, you always have that, that kind of thing going on to, uh, as a way of cleaning up the signal from the 180 that wasn't like a, a perfectly good 180. Okay, so uh, fine details, but you know, it's always done. So. Uh, but before we do the 180, that we just do one of these pulses down here on the on the readout. So just do one of these. So uh, one only. And so what are the you know what are the let's put you know so this is slice select and this guy is phasing code. This guy is readout. Okay, so what is what does that guy do? So so that gradient, it's on it's in the x direction, is going to change our position in k space. It's a positive gradient, and so by the time uh, by the time we get to b, so here's b, uh, it's going to basically um, move us out to, uh, you know, all the way out to the right side of k-space. So again, in terms of what's actually happening in the brain, what is that doing? That's just wrapping up vertical spin phase stripes, positive vertical spin, spin phase stripes, like a lot of them, like 128 of them. So that means across the whole brain, there'll be 128 little, little wraps of the phase of the spin. And so then we'll end up at point B. So here's point B. You haven't recorded any data yet. Uh, and, and then we do uh, the next thing. Yeah, make sure I, the small letter isn't, yeah, okay. So the next thing is we do the 180. And so after, I won't draw what happens during the crushers, but after the crushers are done, uh, then we get to point C in K space. And so what that is, is we go to the conjugate part of, of K space. And the conjugate part of K space is just basically taking whatever KX and KY we were at and making them negative. And so uh, negative KX goes to the opposite side. KY was zero because we're just right in the middle still. <coughs> so negative zero is zero. And so now, we end up at at point C over here. Still haven't recorded any data. Uh, then, um, then what we do is we need to do a phase encode step. So, so here's our. So in practice, you might actually overlap the phase encode step with that with that crusher, but I'll just draw it uh, for the sake of uh, illustration, not overlapped. Okay, so here's our phasing code, and so we just do we just do one of those. That means, like you know, do this, repeat this whole thing, but with each you know, but with each uh, multiple times with different settings of this phasing code gradient. And so after we've done the the phasing code gradient, then we're at point D. So let's say we did let's say we did a positive one. So if we picked out a positive one, then what's going to happen is we're going to start wrapping up spin phase stripes in the horizontal direction. I mean, the, 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 you know, as you go across the stripes, you'll go in the ky direction. So 
So that will um, basically uh, move us up to here, say, say that's the 30 stripes or something, 30 stripes and the uh, <coughs> horizontal stripes, so 30 stripes moving in the y direction. Uh, so, so that's where we are at D. Uh, and then we do our readout. And so, so here's our readout like that. So that will, uh, uh, and then we record our data. So here's, so finally we're recording. So now we're recording. So here's all our data points, like that. So this is, you know, re uh, record, RF, record. No, we don't have the recorder on the whole time. Okay, so then that puts us, uh, that puts us over at um, um, point E, right? So here's, here's point E. So, so now what will happen is we'll, we will turn the readout gradient on, which will sort of like uh, unwrap the X stripes until you reach the center of K space, at least the center for KX, and then rewrap them up to positive 128. And during this whole time, we'll collect all the data. And so we collected like 256 points across K space uh, for a particular... Um, forgot to put the so I have C so here's here's point D and then here's here's point E now uh, <coughs> now the problem is we've got to wait a long time because we want a t2 weighted scan we don't want t1 weighted scan uh, and so so how long do we have to wait well quite a long time because you, uh, you remember, if we wanted a, um, a T2 weighted scan, uh, we're going to, you know, want to essentially find, it would start at more or less the same point, and then we've got two different fall-offs. And so, so we want to sort of wait enough time for our, you know, time of echo. You know, so here's, here's the TE. So we want the time of echo to be long enough so that there's some, some difference. And this might be, you know, say, you know, 50 milliseconds uh, right here at that point. So we want to wait, you know, a reasonable time, 30, 50 milliseconds. But if we want to get a T2 weighted scan, we don't want some T1 in there too. And so, uh, so what happens there is that it's going to take a long time in, in our, until we get back up to MZ0. So here's, you know, MZ0. And so if we've got two different uh, tissue types that have two different T1s, we're going to have to, you know, wait until like, you know, like three or four seconds, which is kind of an eternity if you're sitting in the scanner. <laughs> And you've got to do that thousands of times. So, and why, why are we doing that? Well, we're trying to get rid of this contrast. So if, if we did it at just after one second, then there would be a strong brightness difference uh, due to T1, not to T2. And all we want is the brightness difference due to, so this is, you know, what we're plotting here was the, the transverse magnetization, and what we're plotting here was the longitudinal magnetization. But as soon as we do an RF pulse, it's going to turn that transfer, the longitudinal magnetization into transfers that, that we can record, and then it will make our signal T1 weighted, and we don't want that. So, so that means you've got to wait uh, like four seconds until you do that slice again. So, so here's our, so this is the TR right here. So and that's the TR. Know, for example, four seconds, long time. And now you can see why it's slow spin echo, because this was only one line in one slice. Now, since we're doing a slice, what we could do is let this guy recover for four seconds, this slice recover for four seconds, then do a different slice. 
So select a different slice and then work on that one. But the problem is, even after we've done that, uh, we've done all the slices, there's still a lot of extra time just lolling around, just waiting for, uh, waiting for the recovery to happen. And so that's why it takes 45 minutes to just to get one image of the brain with relatively thick slices. Might be like, you know, four millimeter thick slices. But radiologists still like to use these, and one reason they do is because, so these slices, you know, will be, there'll be a thick slice, like five millimeter thick slice like that, but it will have these small, small voxels in it that extend throughout the slice. And so why, you know, why would you want to look at a slice like that? And the, the reason is because if you're a radiologist and you're looking for something in the brain, you don't want to get confused by all these little thingies, you know, because everybody's brain has little thingies. You've got like a little hole here, tiny little micro stroke that occurred when you fell off the skateboard and slammed into, you know, slammed into the ground. And those things are kind of irrelevant for, you know, it, a, a tumor that's actually going to cause some problem in your brain is going to be a, you know, it's a chunky thing. And so when you take a relatively thick slice, it kind of smears out all the other details. And th so that's one reason why radiologists still like to look at these thick slices, even though we can make much thinner slices now, uh, because it just kind of like blurs out the unnecessary detail. And oh, there's a, <laughs> there's a big chunk here that I can see it's, that survived, you know, blurring those, those slices. So, so these, like I said, these scans are still used, but not too much anymore because they take so long, 45 minutes just for one scan. And so then, then what was the what was the advance? Well, let's just, I should have left those guys up. Uh, let's just do more echoes. So, uh, so here's GZ. So how can we do, do more echoes? So, so the plan is uh, we can do like an echo, an echo train. And so the echo train was if we do 190 and then uh, do a 180, and then after time t equals tau, we get an echo. Uh, and then if we wait another time tau and then a second time tau, then we'll get another 180 in there. And then after another time tau, then we'll get a another spin echo. And so, so let's uh, put, uh, so it's going to go all the way to the edge. So we do the, the, the first part of it is, is the same, but I needed to squish it, squish it a little bit because there's more parts now. So here's a signal coming out and here's one we record. So, so just like before, we do our 90 degree pulse, and then we pick pick out a slice, and then we sort of fix the fact that the slice picker outer messed up the messed up the phase, and then here's the FID coming out, and then we just do uh, one of these. Uh, right here, go to the right side of K space, and then uh, we do a 180 here, and then that one we've got to do the little funny ears on the thing to sort of clean up our 180 because it wasn't quite 180, uh, and that doesn't, if that was a good 180, doesn't cause any signal down here. And then, um, or if there was some, we got rid of it. Uh, and then that amount of time afterwards, there's an echo. So here's our first spin echo. Uh, and so that, so pretty much we'd be in the same, same place. So, so here's, as we were last time, so there's A, and then we went to the right side of K space, that's, uh, that's B. And then uh, we did the 180, and that's uh, C. That flipped us to the left side of K-space. And then we did uh, the readout. So, uh, so here's the, the readout. So, uh, so, so 
This is slice and phase readout frequency uh, frequency encode direction. That's the readout, and so then we end up across across uh, k space at point E. So this guy is uh, point E here. So. But I forgot to put the phasing code in, so we got to put the phasing code in. So that would be like right here. So we just pick one phasing code. There. Say say we picked this positive one, positive one there. So that that would put us at point D. And point D over here, and then we do the readout and collect our data. So now we're now we're actually sort of collecting the data down here. Okay, so that's the, that I just redrew what I had last time. Uh, but now what we want to do is do some more echoes from the same 90. And so so the plan is, so here's, that was, you know, time tau, and that was another time tau when the echo occurred. And if we, if we wait yet another time tau in order to, you know, read out all the echo, uh, and then do another 180, uh, right here, so there's another 180. Then uh, uh, we've got to, you know, do the ears business again to select that slice. Um, and in theory, it shouldn't give us any signal if it was a good 180. Um, but now you can see what the problem is. We're over here. We've got like a bunch of vertical stripes. Uh, from having done this readout, and then we've got some horizontal stripes too. So the stripes are actually kind of tilted a little bit, uh, but they're mostly mostly vertical stripes because uh, we turned on the X gradient for a long time. And so, if <coughs> so if we if we just do another another phase encode and readout, we'll just end up somewhere off in space. And so like really high spatial frequencies, useless high spatial frequencies. And so what we need to do is we have to sort of take into consideration we've got some transverse magnetization. It's hidden, but trans hidden transverse magnetization is still there. And so, so for that reason, we've got to sort of um, do another pulse that will sort of like straighten us back up again. And so the first thing we do is go back to the uh, k y equals zero, and so what is that? That's basically another phase encode like pulse that sort of fixes things up as soon as we finish doing our readout. And so that one is gonna. What, what we want to do is just do exactly the reverse of what we did last time. And so some. Sometimes the way people write this out is they write, let's go through all these steps in this direction and then go through all the same steps in that direction depending on like whichever one you picked. And so that's, so by the time we're done with that, then uh, we end up at point F. And point F is, is pretty much the same as, uh, it's just the same as point B. Uh, so now we're ready to do uh, another 180. And uh, so when we do another 180, what happens? Well, we go back to this side of K space. And so now, now we're at point EFG. And so G is the same as, uh, uh, is the same as, uh, as C. I guess. I guess that uh, F should overlap B. There we go. Looks like we're overlapping. Okay, so point uh, point uh, G is um, back there, and then we can repeat. And so, what does repeat mean? Well, now we've got to do another phase encode, a different phase encode. Uh, and so, let's say we do a Say we did a um, a negative phase encode. So here's we'll start 
we'll do a negative phase encode this time. Uh, and so, so what does the negative one do? It goes like, so we're right here. It goes down, same amount as we went up last time. So that would be point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So now we're at point H. So, so there's point H. Uh, and then we do a readout to go across, go across, and then, sorry, it's supposed to be a solid line, and record all our data points. And so now, now we've, we've recorded a second line from the same 90. And so that will put us HI, so that put, put us at point I. So that, that would be this thing again. So here's, uh, this, this amount of time later, uh, there's another echo, echo happening down here. So it's a smaller echo because there's more T2 decay. Because here's the, you know, here's our E to the minus T over T2. And so while that echo is occurring, uh, we've uh, turned on our gradient and we're, uh, you know, Recording another little burst of burst of data here. So by the time we're done, it gets to point I. And then after that, we've got to undo our phase encode again. So here's so this time we do a positive one to fix the negative one that we just used. So here's the a positive one, and that will, so we're over here, and that will put us back back there again. And so that would be uh, point uh, HI point J. So here's point J, which is uh, the same as the point B. Okay, so now, uh, now we can sort of like etc. So etc. 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 You know, for 16 echoes. So that's good because uh, then we can collect 16 lines of k-space just from 190. Uh, because th this time, these times aren't very very long. Like the echo time. So you know, here here's the. Here's the TE. The echo, you know, that echo time is, you know, 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, something like that. That's a small amount of time compared to four seconds, so we can easily do 16 of these. Uh, but now, if you look at this, you can see why it's not quite as morally upstanding a pulse sequence as as our other pulse sequences, because all the echoes have different T2 times. Because what's the second echo? The second echo, what's the TE of the second echo? Well, it's actually the, the second echo over here. So this is, you know, TE of the first echo. But this is TE of the second echo. So it's not the same. Uh, TE2. And then, you know, the 16th echo is going to have a very long T. So, so that's, a little, that's a little worrisome. So it, it means that different lines of k-space have different amounts of T2 waiting. Uh, and that's actually, actually the case. So, so how do you use this sequence? Well, you could, if you want a T2-weighted scan, then you want kind of a longish echo because you're, you're looking for, and I drew it before, but I'll draw it up again. So, you know, if, if you're wanting a T2-weighted scan, here's like one tissue type and here's another tissue type like that. So you're wanting kind of a longish echo time, you know, which might be, say, like, you know, 40 milliseconds, where there's a big difference. But why waste... 40 milliseconds when we could just do 
you know, this first echo uh, very quickly, we could do this one in like t five milliseconds or something like that, or 10 milliseconds, very short. And so we're, we'd, we'd be wasting all this good signal here. And so what you can do is you can essentially decide to collect the center of k-space uh, with either a long echo time or a short echo time. So, so, the, so basically the, you know, s the, the center of k-space, te, is called the, the te effective. So that, that's, that's the one that will, y there's, there's a, a homework problem on it. That's the one that will most strongly affect the way the image contrast looks is the center of k-space. The very center of k-space affects it, but some of the low spatial frequencies affect it too strongly. And so, so what we can do is if we want to make a T2-weighted scan, what we do is if we look at our echoes, our echoes, will, we will basically wait to collect the center of k-space. So collect other parts of k-space first. Now the signal from other parts of k-space are smaller, and so if we just you know, if we just look at our, you know, magnetization transverse, what it looks like is, here, here's that first echo. It's in a high part of k-space. It, it's got a big starting point, but, you know, we've wrapped up a lot of spin stripes, and so that really lowered the echo amplitude. And then if we're doing 16 echoes, as we get closer to the center of k-space, the whole thing's dying off, but as we go closer to the center of k-space, that makes our biggest echo. And then we can collect, you know, some more of them like that. So basically what will happen is, so this is, you know, collect center, center late. So, you know, big TE, that means T2 weighted. So just by collecting the, the center of, of K space late, we get a T2-weighted scan, but alternatively, what we could do is we could uh, collect the center of k-space at the very beginning, in which case we get a, a really big echo, and then we would get a proton density-weighted one, and then collect other parts of k-space later. So this, if we you know, if we collect the center k-space center late, we get a T2-weighted. If we collect uh, the center of k-space. So, so now we hear collect, you know, center k-space. Center uh, k-space early. Then there hasn't been much time for s contrast, and so we get, uh, you know, we get a, a proton density weighted. So this guy, yeah, PD. So, and we could even do both of these at the same time, which is, which is commonly done. So this is proton density weighted, because sometimes we want to actually just look at proton density. So, um, so this is a very common, common sequence, and you begin to see some of the trade-offs that occur, you know, because you've got all these different uh, all these different echo times. <laughs> so different parts of case, different spatial frequencies have different T1 and T2 weighting. It's kind of weird. Uh, a lot of times if you do this kind of symmetrically, or, you know, you can sort of cancel out some of these uh, inhomogeneities uh, between the different echo times. And, uh, uh, but this gives you some ideas as we slowly push it faster and faster. And then when we talk about, you know, 3D fast spin echo, uh, with or the space scan, we can see we're really ramming things at super speed and doing even more, uh, even more shortcuts uh, than before. But the end result, even though this, the image isn't quite T2 weighted, it, we, we were able to collect the data so quickly and with such high resolution that that sort of wins. And that's, that's, why, that's why we use these more sort of optimized sequences. But they're also they're not just optimized, they're slightly tweaked in a way that makes them sort of a little bit more difficult to interpret than the old slow spin echo. And so that's, 
that's some of the use for slow spin echo. If you wanna, if you've got a new sequence and you wanna see like, you know, how well is my new sequence doing? We can go back to slow spin echo to see what the true answer is and then see how close you've gotten to the true answer. Okay, so that was FSE, turbo, turbo spin echo. So it's a very common uh, pulse sequence that you would use for, for a clinical clinical scan or for an anatomical uh, scan. We do, we would do these often uh, do one of these uh, space scans and take another scan and divide it by the, the space scan to normalize things. Okay, so went over slightly. Any questions uh, about where we are? So I mean like this, so the diagram here, you know, this case-based diagram here is basically uh, our simple 2D way of thinking of this much more complicated reality, which is stripe patterns, you know. So you know, turn, you do the 90, get to the center of case space, you know, come out in 3D, go back when we select our slice. Uh, and then uh, we, we only got to do this guy once, you know, this guy is, you know, once only. Go to the right side of case space only one time. And then do a 180, go somewhere in YK space, read out some data, fix up where we were in YK space, uh, do another 180, puts us over here, go to some other place in K space, different stripes, and then, you know, on, you know unwind and then rewind the, the vertical stripes, uh, collect a bunch of data, and then fix that. Uh, so you can just sort of keep going like 16 times. So that was fast spin echo. Okay. Any questions out there? I kind of pulled my way through with not any space for questions. Okay. Little question. Any question? All good? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so pulse sequences. So we'll, we'll just, over the next week or so, we'll go over all these different uh, practical modern pulse sequences. <laughs>